Good evening aspirants. I welcome you all to the Hindu Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar AS Academy for the newspaper dated 24th of March 2023. Displayed here are the list of articles that we will take up for discussion today. There are 8 articles. Go through it. Now we will start with the first article discussion. In yesterday's Hindu newspaper analysis, we saw about China led framework and how they are acting in opposition to their propagation this text and context article is also written in that same context we all know that the demand for semiconductors is far greater now the demand is rising because these chips are found in every modern electrical appliance and personal electronics device today as a result of geopolitical pressure to protect themselves from supply chain vulnerabilities more and more countries are now attempting to challenge china's dominance in this space businesses are diversifying their operations and avoiding the strategy of investing solely in china since it is the time to grow even our union government has dispersed around 1645 crore in performance linked incentives for electronics manufacturers so far this has been done to enhance india's participation in the electronic supply chain this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us understand few facts about semiconductors and its uses before that the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here you can go through it so what are semiconductors see based on the conductivity of solids solids can be classified into three major types firstly metals they possess very low resistivity that is high conductivity the exact opposite to metals is insulators they have high resistance to the flow of current which means their ability to conduct electricity is low something that is in between these two are the semiconductors they have a resistivity or conductivity that is intermediate to the metals and insulators semiconductors are further classified into two types the elemental semiconductors and compound semiconductors elemental semiconductors are those which are composed of a single species of atoms like silicon germanium compound semiconductors are those that are made of two or more elements gallium arsenate gallium nitride silicon carbide indium phosphide and even aluminum gallium indium phosphide are examples of compound semiconductors here you might have a doubt why semiconductors are used in modern electrical appliances and not metals because metals have higher conductivity right but they are not used instead semiconductors are used see metals have high conductivity which means they conduct electrons very rapidly so it would be hard to switch them off and similarly if we see insulators they do not conduct electrons at all so turning them on would be equally difficult on the other hand if you see semiconductor materials have properties that are just right in the middle and this is why they are preferred now we will see what are the applications of semiconductors see semiconductors are used in memory chips microprocessors then integrated circuits and electronic discrete components like diodes and transistors are made of semiconductors thirdly semiconductors were used as two terminal devices like rectifiers two terminal devices like photodiode semiconductors are used in solar technology apart from this they are used in 3d printing machines then temperature sensors which are used in air conditioners are made with semiconductor devices most importantly semiconductors play a central role in the operation of bank atms trains the internet communication and other parts of social infrastructure semiconductor devices are also used in microchips in computer calculator solar plates and other electronic devices since the semiconductor technology has driven systems efficiency miniaturization and energy savings it will also help to preserve the global environment 
these are some of the applications of semiconductors now coming back to the news article see the semiconductor fabrication units which are also known as fabs turn raw material like silicon into integrated circuits which can be used in electronic hardware but setting up these fabs require highly reliable and high quality supply of water electricity insulation from elements insulation means the act of covering something to stop heat sound or electricity from escaping or entering so fabs are highly capital intensive if we wish to make the sophisticated circuits we need more capital in case of india facilities for assembling finished products have been steadily growing in numbers but fabs for making chipsets and displays which are crucial for manufacturing process for many electronics is very rare so that is why our government has dispersed 1645 crore in performance linked incentives for electronics manufacturers secondly a large part of semiconductor manufacturing involves design and intellectual labor very fortunately india has an advantage here this is because of the large portion of semiconductor design engineers globally are either indian or of indian origin chip making firms like intel have large facilities in india with huge indian talents working on design problems this is an advantage because china is losing control over the industry in the face of sanctions and an aging population so now the minister of electronics and information technology ashwini vaishnav said that the first semiconductor manufacturing fab would be announced in the coming weeks so we have to wait and watch what will happen in the future with this we have come to the end of the discussion for this particular article in this article we saw what are semiconductors we saw that semiconductors are those which have a resistivity or conductivity which is intermediate between metals and insulators and then we saw why semiconductors are used in every modern electrical appliance instead of metals then we saw some of the applications of semiconductors we saw that they are used in memory chips memory processors and uh, further integrated chips diodes and resistors are made of semiconductors and we also saw about the semiconductor fabrication units which convert raw elements like silicon into integrated circuits and we saw that these fabs are highly capital intensive we also saw that india has an advantage in terms of the large pool of semiconductor design engineers and we saw that china is losing control over the industry in the face of sanctions and aging population with these points in mind now we will move on to the next article discussion this news article focuses on the stray dog crisis in india recently there has been news about stray dogs attacking children in india so this article focuses on why there is an issue of stray dogs in india despite various steps taken by the government this is about the article given here so in this discussion today we will look into the points discussed in the article let me start the discussion with this question do dogs belong in the streets the answer is no the article puts forth two reasons to substantiate this answer now let's see the first reason dogs are domestic animals they need constant supervision without human supervision the dogs could turn feral this is because dogs are very loyal in nature and they are very territorial territorial in the sense they protect their territory very fiercely when a dog is fed in a particular area in a street then the dog assumes the entire street as its territory or home it does not allow other dogs or humans into its territory this in turn becomes a public nuisance also when that stray dog gets affected by rabies it becomes a public health crisis and this is the reason why dogs should be kept in homes under human supervision now moving on to the second reason dogs play no ecological role when they are left unsupervised in the streets or public places so this is the second reason stated in the article now we know that dogs are domestic animals and they have a role to play in the society only when they are under human supervision there are some steps that can be taken to address the issue of stray dogs first 
is placing the stray dogs in a shelter away from the public place. Secondly, the stray dogs can be rehomed to a new owner. The next available option is sterilization to prevent uncontrolled breeding. And finally, we have the option of euthanasia, which is nothing but the act of killing an animal in a most human way possible. But euthanasia is done only in the worst case scenario. Despite these solutions available at hand, India still has a huge population of stray dogs. Now we will see why India has such a large number of stray dogs. The first reason is cultural. See, the Indian population is quite tolerant towards stray dogs. The Indian masses even consider feeding the stray dogs as good karma. In some cases, the public have prevented the official effort to remove stray dogs. This is quite opposite to the mindset of the people in Western countries. For example, the people in the US have zero tolerance towards stray dogs. To address the issue of stray animals, every year up to 3 million dogs and cats are euthanized in the US. This is why the US does not have stray animals and India has many stray animals. The second reason is administrative complexity. See, there is a conflict between two laws. One is the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act and the other is the Animal Birth Control Rule Book or the ABC Rule Book. Before looking at the conflict, we will see some points about PCA Act and the ABC Rule Book. See, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 1960 is an important legislation in India that prevents cruelty towards animals. The act prohibits the infliction of unnecessary pain or suffering on any animal. The act also prohibits organizing, promoting or participating in animal fights. And the act also has provision for punishment for the cruelty to animals including fines and imprisonment. In addition to this, the act regulates animal slaughter, conducting experiments on animals, transport of animals and animal markets. Finally. This act allows for the registration and regulation of animal welfare organizations in India. Now coming to the topic at hand. See, the PCA Act recognizes that dogs are domestic animals. The act also says that dogs when left on the streets suffer due to homelessness and are a menace to the public at large. Due to this, the act says that the stray dogs should be sheltered, rehomed, removed or euthanized. Using this provision, the municipal authorities controlled the stray dog numbers in the past. But right now, this is in conflict with the ABC rules. Now, what is the ABC rules? See, the animal birth control rules in India was introduced in 2001 as a means of controlling the population of stray dogs in a human way. The rules provide a framework for the sterilization and vaccination of stray dogs with the goal of reducing the number of dogs in the streets and preventing the spread of rabies. The main reason why these rules were introduced is that earlier the municipal authorities used crude methods like electrification, gassing or poisoning to euthanize street dogs to reduce cost. So to make this process more humane, these rules were famed. The rules provide for the establishment of ABC monitoring committees at the local level. These committees consist of animal welfare organizations, veterinarians and government officials. The ABC monitoring committee is responsible for overseeing the implementation of the ABC program in their respective areas. The ABC rules mainly focus on sterilization to control stray dog population. The rules created a category called street dogs as opposed to strays. This reclassification is the cause of conflict between the PCA Act and the ABC rules. As we already saw, PCA Act while prohibiting cruelty does not restrict the municipality from euthanizing stray dogs. But now there is a category called street dogs under the ABC rules. This has stopped the municipal authorities from euthanizing the street dogs. So this is the main reason why the number of stray dogs have ballooned in recent times. 
also note that very recently the street dogs in the abc rule books were again renamed as community dogs now finally what can be done to address this issue firstly vaccination and sterilization drives must be carried out to stop uncontrolled breeding of strays secondly conflict between abc rules and pca act must be resolved so that the old sick and rabid stray dogs can be euthanized thirdly the public must be made aware of the issue of stray dogs so to all the dog lovers out there if you love dogs take it to your home if you just feed the stray dogs you are doing disservice to both the dog and the public out there finally all the stakeholders like municipalities animal welfare groups public health professionals local residents and the ministry of urban development should be brought together to take proactive steps so in this particular discussion we saw about the stray dog crisis in india and we finally saw what can be done to address the issue so with the learned points in mind now we will move on to the next article discussion look at this small article from the archive session it is a news that was reported 50 years back from today it is about the analysis of samples taken by a ship named glomer challenger oceanographic exploration at that time had determined that antarctica has been a frozen continent for at least 20 million years this was like 3 to 4 times longer than it was previously thought it also confirmed the theory that australia broke away from antarctica some 50 million years ago other finding was that there are traces of natural gas components in sediments beneath the sea floor near the antarctic shores this is the crux of the news article given here in this context let us see some important facts about antarctica know that antarctica is the fifth largest continent on earth and up to 98 percentage of antarctica is covered with thick ice and snow this is because of its position in the higher latitudes of the southern hemisphere here being in a higher latitude means that sunlight that is insulation hits the surface at a very low angle and this means that solar energy is spread over a larger area than it would hit in a lower latitude this is the reason why antarctica has temperature below freezing throughout the year this is unlike the antarctic in the northern hemisphere because in antarctic ice will be floating on water but antarctica is a continent with bedrock under the thick ice sheet here know an interesting fact today there are only two places on earth with ice sheets one is antarctica what is the other place mention in the comment section antarctica's ice sheet is the largest single piece of ice on earth now other than ice sheets antarctica has ice shelves sea ice and icebergs this is about the physical features of antarctica now let us see the physical geography of antarctica see like i said already antarctica is in the southern hemisphere antarctica is surrounded by the southern ocean antarctica can be divided into two parts one is lesser antarctica and other is the greater antarctica the greater antarctica is also known as east antarctica and it is composed of older igneous and metamorphic rocks lesser antarctica on the other hand which is also known as west antarctica is made of younger volcanic and sedimentary rock lesser antarctica is a part of the ring of fire mount erebus located on antarctica's ross island is the southernmost active volcano on earth then talking about ice shelves ice shelves are common around antarctica and the largest ones are the rhone filchner and ross ice shelves now see this map it shows the sea surrounding antarctica note the important ones like ross sea and weddell sea now coming to the climate antarctica has a extremely cold and dry climate in winter there will be complete darkness for 24 hours a day and in summer months the sun barely sets and if we see the precipitation in antarctica it is really hard to measure it always falls as snow the antarctic desert is one of the driest desert in the world 
then the antarctic region has an important role to play in the global climatic process it is an integral part of earth's heat balance see we all know that ice is more reflective than land or water surfaces the massive antarctic ice sheets reflect a large amount of solar radiation away from the earth's surface so this helps in the preservation of earth's heat balance so with this we have come to the end of this discussion in this discussion we saw some important facts about antarctica then we saw about the physical geography and the climate of antarctica firstly we saw that antarctica is the fifth largest continent and it is made up of 98% ice this is because of its position in the high latitudes then we saw that antarctica can be divided into two one is the lesser antarctica and the other one is the greater antarctica greater antarctica is made of older rocks and lesser antarctica is made up of younger rocks finally we saw about the climate of antarctica we saw that it has an extremely cold and dry climate and because of this it is one of the driest deserts in the world and also we saw that it is an integral part of earth's heat balance with these learned points in mind now we will move on to the next article discussion see it's a leak that a 40 year old man threw acid on his 35 year old wife while she was sitting in the waiting area of the court hall yesterday there was a high level of tension at the combined court complex because of this incident in this background let us understand what is acid attack and about the laws on acid attacks see an acid attack is also called acid throwing vitriol attack or vitriolage it is a form of violent assault involving the act of throwing acid or a similarly corrosive substance onto the body of another it is basically intended to disfigure maim torture or kill the other person perpetrators of these attacks throw corrosive liquids at their victims usually at their faces so this burns them damages the skin and often leads to exposure or sometimes even dissolving of the bones the most common types of acids used in these attacks are sulfuric and nitric acid hydrochloric acid is also sometimes used but it is less damaging now if we look at the laws that govern acid attacks in india until 2013 acid attacks were not treated as separate crimes however following the amendments carried out in the ipc acid attacks were put under a separate section of 326a of the ipc such attacks are made punishable with a minimum imprisonment of 10 years which is extendable to life along with fine the law also has provisions for punishment for denial of treatment to victims or police officers refusing to register an fir or record any piece of evidence denial of treatment both by public or private hospitals can lead to imprisonment of up to 1 year and dereliction of duty by a police officer is punishable by imprisonment of up to 2 years but sadly the implementation of the regulations is not very strict and acid is still easily available in many places so in 2013 the supreme court took cognizance of acid attacks and passed an order on the regulation and sales of corrosive substances based on the order the ministry of home affairs issued an advisory to all states on how to regulate acid sales and framed the model poisons possession and safe rules 2013 under the poisons act 1919 it asked the states to frame their own rules based on model rules as the matter fell under the purview of states later in 2015 the ministry of home affairs issued an advisory to all states to ensure speedy justice in cases of acid attacks by expediting prosecutions according to the ministry's directions and model rules over the counter sale of acid was not allowed unless the seller maintains a log book or register for recording the sale of acid this log book was to also contain the details of the person to whom the acid is sold the quantity that is sold the address of the person and it should also have the reason for which the person is procuring the acid the buyer must also prove that he or she is above the age of 18 
sellers are also required to declare all stocks of assets with the concerned subdivisional magistrate within 15 days and in case of undeclared stock of asset the subdivisional magistrate can confiscate the stock and suitably impose a fine of up to rupees 50000 for a breach of any of the directions these rules were made to ensure effective monitoring besides this rules for victim compensation and care were also made they are entitled to get free treatment proper aftercare and rehabilitation Ministry of Home Affairs suggested that the states should also extend social integration programs to the victims for which NGOs could be funded to exclusively look after their rehabilitative requirements. So in this particular discussion, we saw about acid attacks and the laws that govern acid attacks in India. With the learned points in mind, now we will move on to the next article discussion. For our next discussion, let us take this article. This article says that Indian Patent Office has rejected a patent filed by the Johnson & Johnsons. This is because the company tried to extend its monopoly on manufacturing the beta-coelant drug in India. So now this will pave the way for generic drug manufacturers such as Lupin and Macleod's to produce this particular drug. This will ensure cheaper and more wider access to this particular drug. See, bedaquelin is a crucial drug in the treatment of multi-drug resistant TB patients. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us see some facts about Indian Patent Act of 1970. The Indian Patent Act 1970 was established on 20th of April 1972. This is based on the recommendations of the Iyengar Committee report. See, a patent is an exclusive right granted to a patentee for his invention. Any third person cannot use this invention without the permission of the patentee. So basically, it excludes others from using, making, offering for sale, selling or importing the patented products. So it is like a monopoly on the invention. But this is only for an definite period. That is, there is a time limit for this patent. The term of every patent is 20 years from the date of filing of application. So, patents are exclusive statutory rights granted to the patentee by the government for a limited period. In addition to this, if something has to be patented, the invention must meet some criteria. First of all, the invention must be new. It should be novel and non-existent. Secondly, the invention must be non-obvious. A mere change in technology will not give the right of a patent. See, if you are replacing a lighter material in a known machine and telling that it is easy to carry and you are trying to patent it, then it is not possible. Thirdly, the invention must be useful in a bona fide manner. Fourthly, the invention must involve an inventive step. Fifthly, the invention must be capable of industrial application. Finally, the invention should not come under the inventions which are not patentable, like those under Section 3 and 4 of the Indian Patents Act of 1970. See, this Section 3 deals with exceptions. Some of the subject matters which are not patentable include frivolous inventions, that is, inventions that does not have a serious purpose. For example, there was a patent filed in US which is basically an apparatus for facilitating the birth of a child by centrifugal force. It is nothing but a machine that spins a woman around until she gives birth. So this is an example of frivolous invention. Secondly, the inventions which are against public order, morality or which is harmful to the environment. Thirdly, mere discovery of scientific principles. And fourthly, again, mere discovery of a known substance are also non-patentable. So with this, we have come to the end of this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the Indian Patents Act. We saw what is a patent. A patent is an exclusive right granted to the patentee for his invention. This is for a term of 20 years. If something has to be patent, it should meet some criteria. Firstly, the invention should be new and it should not be a very obvious invention. The invention must be useful in a bona fide manner. It should have an inventive step in it. It must be capable of industrial application 
and we finally saw some inventions which are not patentable. This is given under section 3 of Indian Patent Act 1970. With this we have come to the end of this discussion. Now we will move on to the next article discussion. Have a look at this editorial article. This article is talking about the recent IPCC report. See, recently the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released the synthesis report of its sixth assessment report cycle. This synthesis report of IPCC summarized the key findings from its most recent reports. See, this synthesis report earns added legality. This is because the summary of the report is approved line by line by governments of the world. The United Nations Secretary General has called this report a survival guide for humanity. So there is a hope that IPCC synthesis report can shape our collective response towards mitigation of global warming in this critical decade. This is the background. In this discussion, we will try to understand the points provided in this article. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this discussion is highlighted here. You can go through it. Now, let us start by understanding the key findings of the IPCC synthesis report. See, the report confirms that human activity is undeniably driving global temperature rise. The report says that the global temperature has reached approximately 1.1 degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels. This 1.1 degree Celsius temperature rise has already led to rapid and widespread impacts on climatic systems across the world. These impacts strengthen the considerable action in the IPCC report which advocates to constrain global warming to 1.5 degree Celsius rather than 2 degree Celsius. Here, the relative focus on 1.5 degree Celsius rather than 2 degree Celsius has some indications. The first indication is regarding the carbon budget. See, the world's carbon budget is far lower for the 1.5 degree Celsius than for the 2 degree Celsius target. This means that the amount of carbon that the world can cumulatively emit before reaching key temperature limits is far lower for the 1 degree Celsius than the 2 degree Celsius target. See, limiting warming to 1.5 degree Celsius requires the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions to 43 percentage by 2030, whereas the same number for limiting warming to 2 degree Celsius requires the greenhouse gas emissions to be reduced to 21 percentage by 2030. Here we can witness the huge difference, right? See, the IPCC report points out that humanity had already consumed four-fifths of its total carbon budget for 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2019. In that consumption, the developed economies account for the lion's share. The report also notes that the existing modeling studies which are often used to assess emission trajectories do not explicitly account for questions of equity. This means that the existing modeling studies do not explicitly explain about the carbon budget of developed and developing economies. So there is a confusion that who bears the responsibility for achieving this ambitious 1.5 degree Celsius target. Anyway, from an impacts point of view, it is important to aspire for a 1.5 degree Celsius target to reduce the climate risks. Now, the second indication is regarding climate adaptation. As I said earlier, the 1.1 degree Celsius temperature rise has led to rapid and widespread impacts on climate systems across the globe. So, the recognition of greater risks at low temperature necessitates early climate adaptation. The IPCC report highlights that climate adaptation itself has limits. This implies that some losses and dangers of climate change are inevitable. For example, the IPCC report finds that some coastal and polar ecosystems have already reached hard limits in their ability to adapt to a changing climate. Then, 
the effectiveness of some of the adaptation options such as urban greening and restoration of wetlands etc are in decreasing trend with increasing global warming apart from this the ipcc report also argues that at higher levels of warming climate change could lead to cascading risks such as food security this food security in turn will lead to migration which are intensely challenging to manage so these findings point out that mitigation is more essential than climate adaptation this is all about the key findings of the ipcc synthesis report now what are all the solutions to address the issue of global warming for this the ipcc provides us some points the ipcc report advocates the adoption of climate resilient development as soon as possible know that a climate resilient development is a developmental model that integrates both adaptation and mitigation to advance sustainable development for all this sounds like aiming high but in reality the countries should focus on both adaptation and mitigation to limit the temperature rise by 1.5 degree celsius above the pre industrial level in addition to this the ipcc report also assessed many technologies and design options such as solar energy or electric vehicles the report says that these green technologies can help countries to reduce emissions or become more climate resilient in a technically feasible manner know that climate resilience is the ability to anticipate or prepare and respond to the hazardous events related to climate now coming back the ipcc report highlights that during climate resilient development priority should be given to equity and social justice see a climate resilient development pathway is a journey but the destination here should be net zero emission at the global level so if this climate resilient development turns successful it will definitely lead to net zero greenhouse gas emissions thereby this will result in a gradual decline in global temperatures and we will also limit the temperature rise by 1.5 degree celsius above pre industrial levels now moving on to see the progress of the world with regards to global warming mitigation the ipcc report says that there is some visible evidence of progress in the proliferation of laws and policies relating to emissions across the globe apart from this the report also highlights the effectiveness of existing policy tools across the world such as regulations and carbon markets but at the same time ipcc report points out that there are several gaps remaining in humanity's response so far see there are gaps between modeled sustainable pathways and the pledge of nations on ambition gaps apart from this there is also an implementation gap this means that there is a substantial gap between what the countries pledge and what they actually do so now what can be done to fill the gap firstly high investments in clean infrastructure should be carried out in an open and competitive manner apart from this each country should make progress and innovation in the face of inadequate ambition implementation gap and climate finance to conclude we can say that the ipcc ar6 synthesis report is a landmark report this is because the report offers a blueprint for sustainable development as it presents data of present and future damages to ecosystem therefore now it is up to the governments and people of the world to act on the climate risk so with this we have come to the end of this discussion with the learned points in mind now we will move on to the next article discussion the next article is about the congress leader rahul gandhi's conviction he is convicted and sentenced for a period of 2 years in a criminal defamation case now in this situation experts are having different views on whether the conviction and sentencing means immediate disqualification or not so today in this discussion we will try to understand the whole scenario first of all let us start with the basics 
in india disqualification is dealt by articles 102 191 and 10th schedule of the constitution and apart from this representation of people's act also deals with disqualification see rahul gandhi case is with respect to section 83 of representation of people's act 1951 now this is the exact text given in the act a person convicted of any offence and sentenced to imprisonment for not less than 2 years shall be disqualified from the date of such conviction and shall continue to be disqualified for a further period of 6 years since his release so some experts are saying that since rahul gandhi is convicted for a period of 2 years he should be disqualified immediately they are saying this based on the lilly thomas case in the lilly thomas versus union of india 2013 case supreme court said that mp's mlas or mlcs that is member of legislative council if they are convicted of a crime and given a minimum of 2 year imprisonment then they will lose their membership of the house with immediate effect before this case the legislators had 3 months time to appeal their conviction this is based on section 84 of rpa act 1951 according to this particular provision if the convicted legislator appeal within 3 months then the disqualification will also be on hold so it will be on hold until the convicted legislator have exhausted all judicial remedy in lower courts high courts and supreme court of india but lilly thomas case struck down this particular section 84 now if a person is convicted for an offence with more than 2 years of imprisonment then that person should be immediately disqualified based on this only some experts are saying rahul gandhi should be disqualified immediately but some other experts are opposing this see normally disqualification will be formalized only when the lok sabha secretariat issues a notification saying that the seat has fallen vacant and subsequently the election commission orders election to the seat again but since the secretariat has not issued any notification some are saying that mr gandhi should not be disqualified now why the lok sabha secretariat has not issued any notification this is because of the situation that arose in the case of disqualification of mohammed faisal he is an mp from lakshadweep in an attempt to murder case he was convicted and sentenced to 10 years by the sessions court at lakshadweep on january 11 2023 and after the conviction the lok sabha secretary general issued a notification declaring his disqualification from the parliament on january 13 on january 18 the election commission issued the press release announcing by polls on february 27 but mr faisal appealed in kerala high court kerala high court on january 25 suspended the conviction and sentence of mr faisal why did the court do that see the high court said that he is going to remain as an mp for only a limited period of time since the term of his office was going to end so if we consider this and the cost of conducting by poll to fill the vacant seat the high court suspended the conviction and sentence of mr faisal so his disqualification also became inoperative it's obvious right no conviction means no disqualification but the lok sabha secretariat had issued the notification already and election commission has also announced the date for by election so now what mr faisal did he challenged the election commission's decision to announce the date for by elections when his disqualification is itself invalid considering all this lok sabha secretariat has not issued any notification so far because we all know mr gandhi will also appeal so they are waiting for the decision of the court and some experts are saying that since there is no notification his disqualification should not be immediate 
now we have to wait and see what is going to happen with these learn points in mind now we will move on to the next article discussion look at this article here the news is that a rare bronze idol of hanuman that got stolen earlier was retrieved by the idol wing of tamil nadu police after a long struggle see a theft of bronze idols including the retrieved one was reported in 2012 The theft happened in the Chola era Vishnu temple called Sri Varadaraja Perumal temple which is located in the Ariyalur district. Totally four idols were stolen by the smugglers. One was retrieved now and the other three are yet to be retrieved. So this is the crux of the news article. In this context, let us use this opportunity to learn about Chola architecture. First of all, know that the history of Cholas fall into two periods. they are the early cholas of the sangam age and the rise of the medieval cholas and the vijayalaya the medieval chola period is only called as the imperial chola dynasty now in this discussion we will focus on the architecture of the imperial cholas see the imperial chola kingdom was established by vijayalaya around 850 ad know that before establishing his own kingdom vijayalaya was a feudatory of the pallavas Vijayalaya took an opportunity arising out of the conflict between the Pandyas and Pallavas. During that time, Vijayalaya defeated the Pallavas and he captured Tanjavur. This eventually established the Imperial Chola dynasty in the 9th century. See, the rule of Imperial Chola stretched for over 5 centuries until the 13th century. The most powerful rulers of this period include Rajaraja Chola and Rajendra Chola. Know that Rajendra Chola was the son of Rajaraja Chola. With this information, now we will see about the architecture of the Imperial Cholas. See, the Imperial Cholas are mostly focused on temple architecture. The Imperial Chola temples are categorized in two groups. They are the early temples and the later temples. See, the early temples are influenced with Pallava architecture while the later temples have Chalukya influence know that the temples built by Cholas are surrounded by high boundary walls and like the nagara style of architecture the earlier temples are modest in size while the later temples are huge with vimanas or gopuras dominating the landscape the chola temples mostly consist of garbagriha antarala and sabamandaba There are also water tanks that are present inside the boundary of most of the Chola temples. Know that the raw materials such as blocks of gneiss and granite are used to build the temple. Note that gneiss is a high grade metamorphic rock. The important example of an early group of temples is Vijayalaya temple. It was built in the 9th century by the founder of Chola dynasty that is Vijayalaya Cholishwar. Vijayalaya temple is located in Pudukottai district of Tamil Nadu. The important examples of later temples include Bragadeshwar temple of Tanjavur, Bragadeshwar temple of Gangai Kunta Cholapuram and Airavadeshwar temple of Dharasuram. Know that the Bragadeshwara temple at Tanjavur was built by Rajaraja Chola, then the Bragadeshwara temple at Gangai Kunta Cholapuram was built by Rajendra Chola I, who was the son of Rajaraja Chola. and the airavadeshwara temple at darasuram was built by rajendra chola 2 note one important fact here all the three temples are dedicated to lord shiva and they are designated as the great living chola temples by the unesco this means that these three temples were inscribed on the unesco world heritage site with this we have come to the end of today's discussion Now we will move on to the next part of our analysis which is practice questions. Now we will start with the prelims practice question. There are 5 questions. 4 will be discussed by me and one will be the quiz question for the day. Question number 1. Consider the following statements about Animal Welfare Board of India. Statement number 1. Animal Welfare Board of India is a statutory advisory body under the Ministry of Urban Development. Statement number 2. It is established under Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act 1960. Statement number 3, it is headquartered in New Delhi. Statement number 4, it was started under the stewardship of late Shrimadi Rukmini Devi Arundhale. Which of the statements given above is RR correct? 
here statement number one is incorrect the animal welfare board of india is a statutory advisory body under the union ministry of fisheries animal husbandry and dairying here statement number two is correct it is established under the pca act 1960 then statement number three is incorrect it is headquartered in chennai statement number four is correct it was started under the stewardship of late shrimadi rukmini devi arindali so the correct answer for this question is option c two and four only question number two consider the following statements regarding the disqualification of legislators statement number one disqualification of a legislator stands in effect even if the conviction of the legislator is suspended statement number two a convicted legislator has three months time to appeal in a higher court until which he continues to hold the seat which of the above statements is rr correct here statement number one is incorrect the supreme court in the 2018 lok prahari case said that on appeal if the conviction is suspended then the disqualification will also remain suspended here statement number two is also incorrect in lily thomas case the court struck down this provision so the correct answer for this question is option d neither one nor two question number three with reference to the medieval chola sculptures consider the following statements statement number one many of the medieval chola sculptures were casted using gold statement number two chola sculptures were made using the lost wax casting technique which of the statements given above is rr correct here statement number one is incorrect many of the chola sculptures that survive were casted using bronze the sculptures were not venerated in temples instead they were designed to be portable this is to enable the deity to be paraded away from the temple sanctuary both for the god's pleasure and the spiritual benefit of the worshippers this practice still continues today here statement number 2 is correct chola bronzes were made using the lost wax casting technique that is still practiced in india this high skilled process involves the modeling of the figure in wax resin which is then covered with a layer of clay then the clay mold is heated that permits the wax to melt and drain the hollow space is then filled with molten bronze when it cools the clay casing is broken away and the bronze sculpture is polished finally it will be given to the temple here the question is asking for correct statement so the correct answer for this question is option b two only question number four consider the following statements regarding antarctica statement number one antarctica's average annual temperature ranges from about minus 10 degrees celsius on the coast to minus 60 degrees celsius at the highest parts statement number two due to its harsh cold climate no vegetation growth is seen in antarctica here statement number one is correct antarctica's average annual temperature ranges from about minus 10 degrees celsius on the coast to minus 60 degrees celsius on the highest parts of the interior near the coast the temperature can exceed 10 degrees celsius in summer and fall to below minus 40 degrees celsius in winter over the elevated inland it can rise to about minus 30 degrees celsius in summer but fall below minus 80 degrees celsius in winter the lowest temperature ever recorded on the earth surface was minus 89.2 degrees celsius at vostok station on 21st july 1983 here statement number two is incorrect lichens mosses and terrestrial algae are among the few species of vegetation that grow in antarctica so the correct answer for this question is option a one only now this is the quiz question for the day interested aspirants can post the answer in the comments below displayed here are the mains question for your practice interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment box below if you have found a video to be useful like the video share it with your friends subscribe to the channel happy learning